on that note, let's look a little bit more at the regulatory issue and what the regulators want from uh, the uh, panellists here. Um, uh, Philippe, we've talked a little bit before about the sort of what the Fed is pushing uh, uh, parties to do. Um, the ECB also wants um, uh, STP processing rates to improve. Um, do you think that the pressure is um, being felt quite clearly or in your experience with the people that you deal with, is there still um, people not quite so responsive as they should be? I mean, on a cash management, I mean, the, the FSA is pushing very hard. I think the um, what's more, more unclear is what's going to happen in terms of uh, the actual STP rates because it's, it's very hard to impose a set percentage when, when the, 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 the failure rates are really over the, over the map over, over the map in terms of asset classes and, and geographies. So if you, if you look at the OTC derivatives versus uh, U.S. fixed income versus U.S. exchange trading instruments, the throughput rates can be radically different. Um, the, the other aspect I think so is, which is um, unsure, unsure and undefined is the reference data aspect where reference data. Yes, where yeah. the ECB is uh, is trying to, to push a standard. And uh, we think that the, the Fed's going to come right behind it, but I mean that, that would be a worst-case scenario where you have two standards. I mean, you, you have three, too many standards as it is. You, you certainly don't want a standard per market. That would be actually devastating. So you, you, it needs to be an effort where there has to be a, a global standard. It's, it's not that hard, right? I mean, you see the one point here. The CE is a very valid global standard for all instruments. So what you need to do is map CEDAW to to ICINs and Reuters codes and Bloomberg codes. And, and create m data models of that, but then they need to have a strong uh, blessing or, or, or become the law. Uh, so SWIFT also probably has a, a lot of uh, say in, in, in that, in that, uh, that, that area. I think, I think the standards definition is very, very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Damien, are you looking more at your back office now because you know the eyes of the regulators are, you know, um, quite closely examining your banking, just to ask you, or is it more that the pressure is from indirect regulation? So, Philippe mentioned the FSA liquidity risk regulation that's coming in. Are you thinking more about how to optimise your cash and your liquidity? How are you feeling the pressure? Um, at the moment, we're not feeling too much pressure. And I think that it's interesting what Philippe said there, because I think, depending on how you're structured as an organisation, you know, we all have different standards that forced upon us, if you like, and there is no common standard. And I think that, that's what's causing us more grief than anything, is the ability to understand, well, you know, the liquidity risks, say, in London for ING, well, who, who's going to look at that? Is it the DMB? Is it the UK authorities? Does that go up into the group structure? So I think that's the first thing that we were sort of not standing back on, but it's wh where is this going to land, mm -hmm. yeah? And how is it going to be organised and structured going forward from a, a global perspective? From a, an ING perspective, if we're looking at the, the risk that we, we have inherently in the back office, we outsourced our back office well, several years ago, four or five years ago now, um, to a fully functioning, including the staff and everything, went yet. We're actually bringing some of that back in-house now, um, partly because we can probably do use, the techno use their technology but not their staff. And in part, I think you know, this great push to outsource everything, you never outsource your risk, and you've still got responsibility for things. And I can see maybe you're going to start things maybe coming back in a little bit because you know it might be a commodity service as we were discussing earlier, but it's one you might want to be able to sort of put your arms around and touch and feel and monitor it yourself rather than at a distance. And I think that we might see some change in the the, the back office for the settlement side of mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a very interesting point. We can discuss a little bit more about that later. Um, uh, Mark, can I ask you in terms of um, you, you did mention a little bit earlier or allude to a little bit earlier. Uh, the sort of what the regulators m might want. I mean, do you have a clearer sense of what people like the FSA and the ECB want to see in this area of the business mm -hmm. post the crisis? Ultimately, reduction in risk <clears throat> and more efficient markets. Um, mm -hmm. I think we should say the regulators probably get a lot of uh, bad press and they probably get a lot of stick from, from ourselves, the people who work in the industry, but actually they, they have done a fantastic job over the years, particularly in London, to allow the market to interpret guidelines without enforcing too strict a rules and that is the primary reason why our market is so evolved and why London as a, as a uh, uh, global um, trading venue has been so successful. 
the danger in my mind is regulators putting too many changes in too quickly and it's almost like driving a car and coming to a road junction and seeing five signs and not knowing which is the priority and it, it can cause confusion. So I do sympathise a lot with what the regulators are doing at the moment. Um, but just to give examples, we talked about reference data. Uh, Post-MIFID, uh, transaction reporting came in across Europe, which for some countries, such as the UK, actually was, was pretty much standard affair. Uh, for other European countries, it was relatively new. 70% um, of the individual data items that uh, make, make up a trade are reference data. Uh, but yet we have so many issues in reference data. We're the National Numbering Agency in the UK, so we allocate the ISIN codes and the CEDAW codes that, that Philippe uh, referred to. Yet every single institution uh, takes in data in a different way, matches it separately, decides which commercial vendors to use, which all operate different standards. And as a consequence, uh, there's no uh, central uh, way of actually managing this information. So even if firms improve their efficiency in-house, when they actually trade with counterparties, there's still that systemic risk that what is the same thing is interpreted differently. So when you look at regulators in, in the light of things like transaction reporting, it is a very um, important role that they're trying to, uh, to play there, to demand that transactions are reported in a timely fashion. But ultimately, unfortunately, there's still a lot of, break, a lot of breaks uh, of, of those types of transaction reports coming into the regulators, going all the way back to just basic reference data attributes being incorrect. And until that's actually uh, managed, in my opinion, at a, uh, an industry-wide type solution, um, regulators can keep on bringing in changes, but ultimately the data will not improve by those changes alone. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Aaron, I imagine you must have some views on this coming from you know, the leading um, industry standards bodies. Uh, how do you think we can move things forward? I think, as uh, Philip mentioned earlier on, there is a very important role that standards play. And so, so when we talk about regulations, um, a lot of what regulatory initiatives are about is trying to get um, a degree of harmonization, standardization, transparency um, into the industry. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a difficult balancing act. Uh, and I think you're right, Mark, that the, the regulators have, uh, by and large, done a tremendous job uh, in terms of getting that balance right. Uh, the market has changed somewhat. The environment has changed somewhat. So I think the regulators are, are trying to recalibrate -calib that, mm -hmm. that balance a little <clears throat> bit. Uh, but a lot of what they're asking for is, is stuff that you know, uh, all the, the banks would recognize as generally good, sensible, best practice, um, mm -hmm. you know, be it in terms of real-time reporting, transparency, etc. And so standards play a huge role in that. Um, and, and, and I think one of the big things about the financial services industry, um, even the most mature parts, is that it is very fragmented um, in general. Uh, large parts of it are, are frankly, uh, I'd call it a cottage industry. Um, they're still in, you know, still in, in sort of, uh, you know, many years uh, past in terms of catching up. Uh, and I think the regulators, by bringing this sort of commonality and, and uh, harmonization together, particularly from a European perspective, which I think is critically important, uh, is going to move the industry, the whole industry forward uh, very positively. And standards is a, is, a, is, a, is a glue that really will help to bind that industry together. And one of the things that I think is um, interesting and probably hugely challenging, I would imagine, um, is that we're seeing, obviously, the regulators pushing more and more for this real-time view. That's what we're seeing in the liquidity risk requirements, for example. Um, uh, it seems to me hugely challenging. Um, and do you have any views on this? I mean, is it a kind of impossible dream to get to a place where everything in the back office is done in real time, you've got the information at your fingertips, so, you know, God forbid another Lehman Brothers occurs, you know where you are immediately, you don't have to spend two weeks finding that out. I think it's, um, it's a challenge, um, but I don't think it's necessarily regulatory driven because it's a state of play you want to be in anyway, and I think one of the, one of the real keys to it is the, the reference data. If you have common reference data within your organization, that makes it easy to see what's happening in real time when you've got to map and translate the same information through multiple different standards to find out what it is. That actually makes it very, very difficult to do anything in, in, in real time. So I think the, um, I see no reason you cannot have that sort of real-time view of what's happening on the world with, with things going through. If you get the reference data right, you get your core processes talking to each other. I think the organizations that have multiple processing centers, multiple tools, that's very, very hard. You then have this massive layer of trying to consolidate which stretches things time-wise. Again, as I said before, I think it, it does bring other risks. Mm -hmm. You have this beautiful real-time world 
mm. and then something goes wrong with it and you beautifully mess everything up in real time and you 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 affect everything yeah sure you know it's not for free i mean in that respect i mean is real time necessary is near real time enough is a kind of intraday okay i mean is is this sort of a bit of a myth it has to be you know real time click your fingers i personally would say that um real time is the nirvana um, but the reality is for our industry uh, to do something which sounds as simple as Andrew just pointed out there is an enormous task. Uh, if you look at other industries like retail and supermarkets, uh, barcodes, electronic transformation of data between suppliers, it's all standard affair for those types of industries, very efficient. Uh, if we look at our own industry, in my opinion, to uh, make such a change to have common data used by every single firm and, and real-time views of where the firm is, it, it is a Nirvana solution to get to, but the reality is to actually to actually move uh, along that, uh, that journey to get to a real-time position would probably require our industry to stop and take <laughs> a step back and maybe a year out, I'm not that we can do that, and actually make that type of an investment um, because of the competition that exists across the firms. Uh, I personally don't think it will happen. Um, I, I, think, I think it's got a possibility. I think the... I don't see how it would happen. <coughs> I think there's been a lot of drive, a lot of competition has come from product. You know, can my product be better than Damien's product? How quickly can we get that to market? How do we differentiate? And he'll come up with a CDO, so I'll have a CDO squared, you know, and it's driven down that road. I think there is competitive advantage that can come through processing now and I think there is naturally a, a simplification of products that the banks are uh, you know are offering to offering to clients and you have to differentiate somehow so I think the the actual processing and level of service will become more important once it's considered to be a more of a competitive advantage rather than a utility then we will get the focus and the investment and real time do I need real time? No, but I need to be a little bit faster than Damien, so whatever he's doing, if I'm a little bit quicker, then I'm ahead. Okay. Um, I love your point about the competitive differentiation, and we'll definitely examine that a little bit more later. I just want to bring in Philippe on this. We, again, this is something that we've talked about before. Um, give me your response to the views you've heard so far. This must be you know, some interesting insights here. Um, well, f f I mean, f for me, I mean, you, you can spend billions of dollars fixing your, your problems. You, you, you're only as good as your counterparties, right? So it's, you, you always have people who are ahead of the curve and people who are behind the curve. And, and you, you, I mean, there's certain hedge funds that calibrate the size of the trades according to how good the, the, the back office and counterpart is. And that's the essence of the problem. So I think that, that, that calls for some of these processes to be moved outside because you have a very sophisticated system. You're dealing with a hedge fund that's managing half a billion dollars and they have three people in the back office. So you, you have this imbalance that will, that will always be there. Thank you.